I'll, I'll start. Um, welcome to Center for Khmer Studies. Um, center for Khmer Studies is a center dedicated to research and education on all aspects of Cambodian society and culture. Um, our main offices are in Siem Reap, but we also have we also have an office in Phnom Penh. Um, we hope you'll, if you don't already know Center for Khmer Studies, I hope you'll check out our website and, and look at the many activities we're involved with. Um, so I'm John Marston and I'm, uh, for six months, I'm a scholar in residence here in, in the Siem Reap office. And today we're very lucky to have um, a talk by Jessica Garber. And Jessica Garber is a doctoral candidate in social cultural anthropology at Boston University. Her bachelor's degree and master's degree both were focused on education and her anthropological research in Cambodia was has also has an educational focus. Um, so today she's going to be, her talk is finding yourself educational aspirations among Cambodian universities students in Phnom Penh. I think many of us are especially interested in the situation of education and maybe especially university education in Cambodia, which is at a something of a crossroads, it seems to me. And so I think we'll, we're going to find this talk particularly interesting. And so, um, so uh, welcome, Jessica. Thank you so much. Um, let me go ahead and set up my slides so that you can all you all can see them, and then I'll go ahead and get started. Can everyone see everything? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so before we officially begin, I just wanted to thank CPS for one hosting this webinar and of course for providing funding for my dissertation research. Um, and I also wanted to thank uh, Professor John Marston, one for your for your introduction, but also thank you so much in advance for moderating. Um, I really appreciate you all taking the time. Um, and I really look forward to your comments at the end of the talk. Um, lastly, I did want to thank everyone for coming this morning. Um, or this evening, as it is for me in Boston, at least. <laughs> so welcome, and thank you so much for taking some time out of your morning to join us. Um, yeah, I, I really look forward to everyone's questions and comments at the end of the presentation. So um, like Professor Marston said, uh, my presentation today uh, titled, my presentation today is titled, Finding Yourself, Educational Aspirations Among Cambodian University Students in the Film and um, which is a preliminary look at the ethnographic research that I conducted in Phnom Penh between 2021 and 2022. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a roadmap to this presentation before we get started for the next 30, 40 minutes, um, I wanted to provide a little bit of brief explanation of the structure of the talk. So my aim in this talk is to provide both a sense of the preliminary themes and quote unquote findings, they're very tentative right now, but I wanted to give those first a first look at those um, to you today. Um, but I also wanted to speak to um, any potential researchers in the audience um, who may be interested in qualitative research and understanding how I approach qualitative research as an anthropologist and ethnographer. Um, so to do that, I'm gonna go through my research question. I'm gonna talk through a little bit about the data that I collected as well as the um, modes of analysis that I have been using so far in my research and in the writing process. And then I will go into seven of the four broad themes that are guiding my dissertation research so far. And then um, I will go into a little bit more of a conversation about two specific themes that I am currently exploring and have been writing about more recently. Um, I'll, then I will finish with some preliminary findings and then we'll open the webinar up for your questions and comments. So to get started, um, my dissertation project aims to understand what factors have been influencing young Cambodians as they pursue bachelor's degrees in the capital city of Phnom Penh. 
the broader question that my dissertation asks is how does attending you how does attending university impact the ways young Cambodians think about their next steps in life and what constitutes a quote unquote good life um, that can come in the form of success that can come in the form of providing certain material goods or reaching a particular socioeconomic status. But I want to examine a little bit about how um, attending university and the ways that young people are, are orienting themselves to participate in schooling for such an extended period of time in their lives, um, how that is changing the way that they think about their life trajectory. Um, so most you'll notice that most of my research takes place outside of the walls of a university and of a classroom um, that's a very intentional move because i do want to think about how those um, practices that students are looking at and experiencing as they go through school is impacting other aspects of their life so to do that um, and to answer this question, I collected data from a variety of different sources, all geared towards um, young Cambodian university students and alumni. So alumni, I took about uh, one to five years post-graduation, but that was extended for particular, um, particularly um, interested interlocutors of mine. And um, so the age range that uh, of my interlocutors was between 19 and 30 years old. Um, and the primary, um, the only primary like, boundary around my interlocutors was the fact that they lived in Phnom Penh or they had graduated from a university in Phnom Penh in some, or were attending university in Phnom Penh. Um, so so my primary method of data collection um, was through ethnographic fieldwork, uh, which meant that I spent time going to places where university students spent their time. Um, at the beginning of my work, uh, since, like I said, I was in Cambodia doing my ethnographic field research between August of 2021 and August of 2022. Um, you'll, you may notice if you are familiar with Cambodia between August and November that universities were largely closed between August and November of 2021. So at the beginning of my field work, um, I spent a lot of time in online spaces that university students were occupying or other spaces around the city. Um, so, the um so the sorry <laughs> so the i so the spaces where they are largely going were these online open um, university student directed facebook groups um some of them came in the form of anonymous confession sites where students would post anonymously questions that they had or um, frustrations that they had or um, just generally wanted to talk about issues that they didn't want associated with their name and um, other members of the Facebook group could then comment and support or otherwise help whoever was asking the question. So there was a lot of time for university students to develop these kinds of online spaces during the pandemic and so that was a big part of um, one of the main parts of my research at the beginning. Um, and has continued to develop into a great source of information um, beyond my 62 interlocutors who I interviewed. Um, aside from these open university student Facebook groups, I also participated in online events during that time and continue to participate in the offline versions once um, larger events started to become more commonplace in 2022. Um, I attended job fairs, workshops, book fairs, one of which CKS hosted in Siem Reap. Um, I attended motivational speaker workshops that were held online and other webinars in that kind of vein. Um, and then I also participated as a guest lecturer in some classes or in other organizations around Phnom Penh. To talk a little bit about my own journey as a researcher and to go through, um, to give a, maybe some topical lectures that would be relevant to the course. Um, Aside from all of this wonderful ethnographic data that I was collecting, I also took time to have um, semi-structured interviews with 62 university students and alumni. Um, those 62 interviews were broken down between 40 women, 20 men, and two self-identifying gender-fluid people. 
um, who were from Phnom Penh, from a variety of different provinces. I believe the official total was 23 different provinces. Um, and on top of that, in order to get a little bit more context, I also talked to six university staff members or leaders of student-focused organizations. So this wasn't one of the, any of the larger youth organizations that are present in Cambodia. However, it was um, organizations that my interlocutors told me were really important to them and were really important to their friend groups. So um, part of how I collected or how I um, engaged different interlocutors and participants in my research was through the snowball method. So I um, I engaged in different networks of university professors and other um, organizations that catered to university students, and that's how I met and became involved with different these different activities around Phnom Penh and conducted my interviews. Um, when I concluded my research in August of 2022, I approached analyzing my data in a few different ways. Um, I started with, um, of course, taking transcripts of all of my um, interviews, which were conducted in both English or Khmer, uh, depending on my interlocutor's preference. Um, I had assistants help me with the Khmer transcriptions, and I transcribed the English um, interviews myself and um, started to conduct descriptive coding or um, basically kind of markers in, in these interviews to um, illuminate areas where students were talking about their family life, motivations for attending school, marriage, adulthood, and dating. Those were the primary um, codes that I was going into my data with and interested in finding out more information. So those were my deductive codes. Um, the inductive codes that I developed after looking at and um, spending more time with my data included some a little bit more um, uh, pinpointed or targeted kinds of aspects of the university students' lives, including filial obligations or obligations that they felt towards their parents, um, student employment and volunteering, um, their sexuality and exploring that, um, choosing a major and scholarship opportunities that really helped them to motivate them and to get them to where they wanted to be. Um, but alongside of this descriptive coding process, um, I also employed um, what John Saldana has called um, paying attention to how my notes feel, um, which means not only what my interlocutors are saying, but the kinds of emotions that they're they're expressing while they're saying it, and also what kinds of emotions that they're expecting me to express and how it, their, um, their narratives and how their descriptions made me feel as well. And from that, um, I learned a lot about the way that my interlocutors were thinking about um, these next steps in their lives and the ways that they were thinking about um, building a future for them and their families. Um, of course, I am just about in a midpoint of my analysis and writing process. And so moving forward, there's a lot of other things that I want to analyze as I continue to look at this very rich body of data of field notes and transcripts. Um, I also want to continue the descriptive coding that I have begun and go a little bit deeper, possibly in your, um, find a few other inductive codes that are emerging as, as I continue to look at my data. And then I also want to transition a little bit more into values coding, um, which is attaching uh, or is, is determining what kind of meaning is attached to particular experiences or concepts that my interlocutors are talking about. Um, and also kind of interrogating how strongly the person felt about the kind of experience that they had or the um, or the, the way that they went through that experience or the advice that they would give others if they were in the same position. And then I also want to think through a little bit more about this question of what they think is their own opinion and what they think is to be what they think is a, an opinion that is generally held by other young people in society. Um, differentiating between those two things is something that I'm um, very interested in continuing to look at as I look at one of the themes that I will go into right now. Um, so based on that preliminary analysis, I have four broad themes that I have come up with and want to continue writing about as I continue with the dissertation process. 
Uh, the first theme is around aspiring education. So I want to look at um, what are what is motivating and what is um, what is making edu university education desirable for young Cambodians? What's driving them to pursue this lengthy time in school to get to a certain point in their lives? Um, and how are they motivating themselves to continue to overcome all of the obstacles in their paths? So that can range from um, expectations based on their gender. That can, that can also lead to expectations based on where they grew up. Um, so scholarship opportunities, um, navigating the, the capital city, which is for most people, one of the largest cities that they will ever have ever experienced in their life. Um, all of those things are obstacles in their path. So I want to look at what is motivating them and how people are talking through those obstacles in order to keep motivating themselves in forward through to get a bachelor's degree or two. Um, another theme that I've um, that I found as I go through my data is uh, looking at how social networks and planning for the future um, are contributing to the way that university students are planning and kind of, and strategizing as they go through the university process. Um, so throughout the inter interviews with my interlocutors, some people say that certain jobs make people better suited to uh, or better prepare them for certain aspects of their future lives. So what kinds of opportunities, whether it be jobs, internships, or volunteer opportunities, are seen as more appropriate than others? And why is that the case? I wanted to look a little bit more on that. And I also want to think about how um, young Cambodians are thinking about building their social network into their career network. So building beyond um, both the walls of the university and the support from their lecturers and other university staff that they're familiar with and beyond their family networks and into um, a future career or a particular um, pathway that they're interested in. Um, the third theme that I wanted to explore through my dissertation is how um, gender norms are being renegotiated as university students are exploring this longer period of time in school. So particularly this focuses on uh, women's sense of self, um, but as I talked a little bit later, it also talks through a little bit more of what um, young Cambodians are thinking are the roles for young men and women as they move forward towards um, marriage and dating and partnership. Uh, the fourth theme that I want to consider as I go through the rest of my dissertation is um, how university students are finding their own path in life and balancing that with being a quote unquote good child to their parents. So how they think about their role as a child in university, I'm sorry, as a child in their family and uh, their obligations to their parents. Um, how they balance those obligations also with the, um, the responsibilities that comes with being um, a child in a Cambodian family, the responsibility to make sure that your parents are cared for, to make sure that everyone in your network has the resources that they need. So all of those are a big part of my dissertation so far. So today I want to focus on just two of these themes because if I talked about all four, it would be a much, much longer talk. So we'll just focus on two today and I will talk through a little bit of the data that I have been looking at so far. And you know, you'll get to meet some of my interlocutors who I have given pseudonyms um, and um, see how they are navigating these two spaces. So I'm going to be looking specifically at the renegotiation of gender norms. And then I'll be turning to um, the aspirations around education and the motivations university students have to pursue higher education. So the first um, theme that I wanted to share with you is my um, is around renegotiating these gender norms. So my approach to understanding how gender impacts how people move through society is influenced very particularly by Judith Butler, who promoted understanding gender contextually by understanding how markers of gender identity are interrelated and performative. Um, this means that I address how young women, as well as men, are differently navigating common difficulties and actively shaping gender roles and expressions in Cambodia. Um, I 
do have a focus on women at particular times. As you'll notice, I interviewed 40 women and 20 men and two gender fluid people. And so I do have a plethora, a variety of women that I talk to, um, but I do know that they are not creating their own um, gender expression and their own feelings about gender in a vacuum. And so the 20 male participants that I call on throughout my dissertation will be very important to both supplement and understand the context around which women are responding. Um, so one of the other things that is very common, like I have been saying throughout um, my discussion of my themes, is how um, that is also wrapped up in gender and these uh, norms around gender um, are how, <laughs> how young Cambodian people are good, enact good children to their parents. Um, so in this sense, based on what my interlocutors have told to me and other um, very influential sources, um, good children graduate. They find stable jobs that they enjoy, enough at least. Um, they become financially independent and maybe even own their own house and where they could live with their family and perhaps even their parents, depending on where they fall in the um, sibling uh, lineup. So taking on these responsibilities is a high priority for a lot of my interlocutors, um, particularly of um, particularly on the minds of uh, the inter my interlocutors on the older end of the spectrum as they approach the uh, completion of their bachelor's degrees, of course. Um, so, but men and women experience this kind of uh, relationship and expectations around being a good child differently. So. For some, like uh, Neria, who is a 24-year-old um, woman from Siem Reap, um, she felt pressured to get married pretty much as soon as possible after graduating. Um, but it's important to note that she needed to wait until after graduation in order to do so because she needed to make sure that she was um, focusing as much as possible on her studies in order to do well and um, succeed in the way that she wanted to post-graduation. So, um, but in some ways she was saying, okay, I can, I can navigate these difficulties and I can navigate these, um, this pressure because it didn't feel as crushing. For other young women, that pressure to get married was a little bit more, um, was a little bit more visible for them as they went through their lives. Um, and so there's a range of experience that young women experienced with their, um, with their relationship with their parents that is contributing to that as well. Um, two other young women, uh, Tina and Bormai, um, were two young women who wanted to delay marriage as much as possible in order to maintain a sense of their own freedom. Um, and they were also a good example of how young women were thinking about the relationship between making sure that they um, performed a good child to their parents, while also making sure that they retain different aspects of their own Cambodian femininity as, as they went through these different processes in their lives. Um, um, Tina and Borame were particularly adamant about their own expression of freedom because they were often, um, they had a really big desire to travel, like some of the other, some of my other interlocutors. And so they felt this um, pressure to travel as much as humanly possible and to have a plan set up as clearly as possible so that they could uh, see everything that they wanted to see and explore everything that they wanted to explore and gain as much um, educational and other experiences possible prior to getting married because they felt like their husbands might curtail some of that freedom or they felt like their family responsibilities of uh, becoming pregnant and raising children would limit their possibilities for exploring those things in the future. Um, on the other hand, the young men that I interviewed expressed a kind of a more ambivalent or um, relaxed way of feeling about marriage. And so, um, of course, they see 
the young men like Ritzy, who is a 25 year old from who grew up in Phnom Penh, he felt like marriage was enabling his success. And so he was looking forward to getting married with his partner, whoever it might be. He was not dating anyone at the time, but he was looking forward to marriage as a partnership with his future wife to make their dreams of having financial stability and raising a family together um, a reality for them in the future. And even for young men like Sotia, who was a 22 year old who also grew up in Phnom Penh, um, marriage was kind of this inevitable reality in their futures, um, but it wasn't a rushed kind of thing, just the same as the way Rati was experiencing it. Um, and in fact, Sotia had tried to date while he was in university and he felt like having a girlfriend took too much time away time and mental energy away from his studies. And so, um, and his girlfriend expressed to him that she felt the same way. So having a girlfriend and finding a partner during university feels like a little bit of a, an impossibility for both young men and women. And so being able to negotiate these boundaries around what is appropriate behavior and what isn't um, is another area that I am looking at and continuing to look at as I go through my data. Um, and like Sotia, unsurprisingly, dating was still a part of some university students' experience. And so one of the areas in which I explore this is through uh, explore um, renegotiating gender norms and how university students are experiencing those gender norms in their daily lives is through the practice of dating or lack thereof, um, because some people were very adamant that they just did not want to date until they were ready to get married. Um, one of the ways that I looked at this kind of frame around dating is, of course, as you'll see on the slide, um, expressions of um, trying of young people trying to find partners in online spaces, particularly when university universities were still closed for uh, students to be on campus. And so there were often posts asking, um, what kind of person should I look for? How should I meet someone on campus? Is anyone going to campus when universities did open up? If you are there and you want to meet, let's meet at this particular place. And so there was some kind of um, pro-socialization as university students were coming back to campus and getting into a more face-to-face -face rhythm of life. Um, and this brought new questions of um, how those longer standing norms around appropriate behavior, uh, which had already been kind of starting as young people began to think about dating, whether in their high school experience or just when they started university, um, and how they might be changing when they spend more time in school. And unlike some of their peers, waiting to get married until after graduation, which could be 22, 23, 24 years of age. Um, and with that comes um, negotiations of what is appropriate to do when you are dating someone. So one of the things that was often posted as an anonymous post on some of these open Facebook groups were questions about the rules around dating. Um, what could, could and could not be appropriate was often a question that um, posts assumed to be posted by a young woman would ask other members of the group. So um, they asked questions about whether or not it was okay to engage in premarital sex or cohabitation before getting engaged or married. And there were a lot of different ways that people would respond to that, st to that statement. Uh, for some, there was an openness and acceptance um, that while they would personally not engage in those kinds of practices, um, they know that others know what's best and know how to live their lives and they don't have much say on that. For others, it was seen as a sign of um, their of people losing their sense of self-respect um, or their partners um, in the dating situation to lose respect for them. And so there's a lot of questions around what is appropriate for young women and young men to expect in this kind of dating relationship that can last from year one through year four and beyond before they are ready to get married or could last as little as six months. So there's a lot of room for negotiation of what is appropriate for both men and women. Um, 
Now I wanna to turn to my second theme that I'm currently exploring, which also has a lot to do currently with um, young women's explorations around motivation and inspiration for attending university. Um, and what is, um, and what is creating a, um, an, an aspirational image for young women to attend university, but also young men, <laughs> um, because the hurdles that they face are, are joint, they are connected in different ways. Um, I, like I said, I've so far been focusing primarily on young women because um, they are my largest, the largest portion of my data set. However, these um, inspirational narratives do span both genders. Um, you'll see I have uh, Tavri Ton's inspirational memoir that is published in English and now in Khmer, um, A Proper Woman or Nyeri um, Burpai. Her, her narrative focuses on young women and making sure that they are taking advantage and becoming, as she puts it, the captain of their own lives, I quote. Um, and so I'm looking particularly at how those narratives are um, being drawn on by my interlocutors and understood as things that are that should be um, inspirational and aspirational for them. Um, and for some women um, like Sapal, who was 23 and grew up in Persat province, um, the opportunity to pursue a bachelor's degree meant creating upward social mobility for her family. This meant for her a particular motivation to and desire to um, develop their her hometown or give back to her community through um, knowledge sharing, through building a social network to help others um, pursue the same path that she did, um, but also as a as a role model for other young women or young men to attend university in Phnom Penh. But more um, uh, more local, local, more locally, sorry, um, that she also felt a desire to help um, her family achieve financial stability um, while also achieving financial stability and um, a higher social class, socioeconomic class herself um, after graduation. And so there were a lot of different ways that the motivations and aspirations that young people had around um, attending university were wrapped up in both family um, expectations and hopes and dreams, as well as um, their own personal motivations, their own desire to learn more, to grow more, and to experience more of what the world could offer them. Um, which leads me to another young woman um, who I call Chanari, who was a 23-year-old young woman from Batambang. Um, who sought a bachelor's degree in order to pursue that more and go beyond her village um, to both explore the capital, which she um, very much wanted to do, and other countries around the world um, eventually. So her, her, one of her main motivations for pursuing higher education stemmed from this desire to go out, explore, see more, do more, and um, experience a wider variety of ways of life and ways of communicating with other people um, that she couldn't get by remaining in her hometown or remaining in her own province for university like other young Cambodians do throughout the country today. Um, she had a desire to become a leader in her, in her family, but that created a little bit of attention because the rest of her family was not as supportive of her pursuit of education because they felt that it was too much of a delayed investment in what they felt was a very sure job future for themselves and for, for other members of their family. And so she both navigated wanting to pursue more while also wanting to um, give back to her parents more immediately as a, a as someone who was just starting to transition into adulthood would want to do. They want to perform different aspects of becoming an adult. And part of that process includes making sure that your family is cared for financially, as well as um, care cared for in the actions that you do to support them in their daily lives. Um, and so even as she continued to take these steps away from her family and to pursue a path that they didn't necessarily agree with, she constantly felt compelled and drawn to provide financial resources to her family 
by getting a job in Phnom Penh that she could um, that she could work at in her um, in her downtime from university class from her university class shift, and um, continues to send and support um, her send sorry send money and support her family throughout any um, throughout her experience in university, which continues to today as she's pursuing her second. Um, bachelor's degree abroad. Um, so, sorry about that. Um, the the um, the as I've been going through uh, my preliminary analysis and going through the different um, ways of looking at my data, I've also been um, I've also been developing beyond those four broad themes. Um, I've also been developing a way of looking at them that attends to that analytical frame of um, feeling through my data that I was talking about earlier. Um, so I found there's two broad sets of ideas and theories that have been particularly helpful in this process. Uh, the first, um, as my project primarily asks the young people to think about and reflect on their plans for the future, um, that area of interrogating and thinking about the future is part of the educational process, uh, which I take from Stanbach and Hall directly who call on uh, and point to education as inherently future oriented. A lot of people are in school for a particular um, future purpose. Um, they may be in school as primary school students uh, because they need to be um, according to their government or according to their own needs and their own desires, but that then transitions as they get older and older into thinking of it as, a, as serving a particular end. Um, and so when we think about schooling in that way, it draws on and asks questions about how we think about the future. And so I found um, the anthropology of the future and theories in that broad, um, in that broader um, realm of questioning to be particularly helpful in helping me think through these aspects of what young people are planning. And from Bryant and Knight, um, I think through their, their theory about the anthropology of the future um, helps me think through how these big um, big moments in young people's lives come, come into how they think about their daily actions and not just these major milestones of graduating from high school, graduating from university, um, getting their first job, getting married, beyond those broad signposts of achievement as they move towards their future. Um, young people are also taking deliberate and very specific actions as they move through their daily lives. Um, and so paying attention to those helps us think about what kinds of um, direction that they think that they're aiming for, which brings in the second part of Bryant and Knight's theory, which is this idea that the future inherent also inherently um, takes us from one point to another in a teleological way. So in a way that the means are to a specific end. So we have a particular endpoint in mind when we're thinking about how we're doing the things that we do on a daily basis to reach those major milestones to then reach this future point. Um, but the other aspect of um, the way that my interlocutors have been thinking about the future um, is how hopeful a lot of my interlocutors were about what that future contained. Um, for, other, for others around the world, particularly um, young people in, across Asia, South Asia and other parts of East Asia, as well as the Middle East and North Africa, um, the hope that degrees will translate into jobs has largely been found to be a false hope that people need to um, work through as they continue to think about their own path through life. So many young people are existing in this state of, quote, weighthood, um, where they cannot find a job um, with the degree that was supposed to provide, um, and so are stuck in a state of underemployment or unemployment, waiting for their dreams to come true, and waiting for those dreams to manifest into that reality. 
Um, however, while I was analyzing my data, the predominant feeling that emerged from my conversations with interlocutors was the sense of optimism um, around the potential for young people's own futures, but also for their nation's future. So it wasn't just about what young people were hoping for their own individual selves, but it was also tied into the sense of what Cambodia held for them in the future. And this optimistic vision of the future um, within their schooling experience and within their education leads me to think about how becoming educated could be what um, feminist scholar Sarah Ahmed calls a happy object, um, which is a, um, a theoretical concept that she uses to describe um, a concept or a, um, a concept or some other aspect of people's lives, like um, a literal object. It could mean like having a particular thing. Um, and how that promises happiness to those who pursue it. So the mentality of, as soon as I achieve this, I will become happy. Those are the kinds of happy objects that she's referring to. And I think as I continue to look at my interlocutor statements, education is becoming one of those happy objects. If I am able to obtain this um, degree or this particular um, experience, those things will lead to my future happiness and success, which translates both to financial success and economic markets, markers of success, but also to social happiness with their families and with their social networks. So with that, I will stop here and say thank you so much for attending the talk and um, listening to my presentation. And I look forward to hearing all the questions that you may have. Okay. Um, I seem to have a different background than I had before. Um, so sorry if I'm a little bit suspended in uh, something here. Um, Thank you so much, Jessica. That was a very interesting talk. And, and these are things that I think are, are very, very much being discussed, very much of interest in Cambodia today. And, and, and incidentally, I'll note that, that the number of participants seems was pretty large compared to what we often get. And, um, and I think that the, the number I'm seeing doesn't include the people who are accessing by Facebook. Um, <clears throat> so uh, again, there's one question already in the Q&A, but maybe I'll start. And I suspect that once we get started, um, <clears throat> a lot of people are going to start writing questions. So please, please, <clears throat> please start writing your questions now. But I'll start again. I <clears throat> And thank you for this overview. And Especially notice, of course, we, <clears throat> we are in anthropology, we make this distinction between the edict and the emic. And uh, e edict mean the view from afar and emic where you're trying to, to, to get at how you're, the people you're researching think themselves. And so one of the very positive things about this was the, the degree to which we get an emic picture. We get you know, we get a glimpse of what what young Cambodians who are at attending university are are thinking themselves, and that's one of the things that's so valuable about this. My question, um, and I know this was, you know, this is a short talk, and it's a simplification of all the work you're doing. But what I was thinking as I was sitting, you know, this is there's so many different kinds of universities uh, in Phnom Penh. There's <clears throat> there's, you know, Royal University of Phnom Penh, there's a technical school, there's, there's state universities, there's also private universities like um, uh, uh, American University of Phnom Penh, and then there's, uh, and there are many universities that have less clearly accreditation um, than others. And so um, also you mentioned that you interview people both from from who were from the city and from the provinces. So I, what I would like to see, I'd like to be interested in to what extent 
you found in your research, you found variation in responses. Like, did the people who were from the country, who were born in the country, in the provinces, that were their responses different than the people who were born in the, the city? Or were the people who say were attending a technical university, were they different than the people who were studying, studying at Royal University of Phnom Penh? I just would like a sense of, of what you found on, on those areas. Absolutely. Um, I just to give a little bit of context. Um, there's just so many different aspects of my my research that I could talk through. So, of course, I'd be happy to share what kinds of universities I where where my my interlocutors came from in different university capacities. So, I interviewed students across. Um, I believe it was three different private universities. Um, I'm hesitant to name them in a recorded seminar, but. Um, they were three different private universities and the Royal University of Phnom Penh, Royal University of Law and Economics, Royal University of Agriculture, ITC. Um, those were broader, uh, broadly where I got most of my participants, um, just to give you a sense of the variety of different universities um, that I was looking for. And the primary motive behind that was more about getting students from a variety of different majors to provide input into this plotting of the future and thinking about the future. So I didn't want to just have students in one particular major because that would kind of skew my data in a, in a way that I did, wasn't really hoping to have. I wanted to give a, a broader view of what students across different um, types of study might be thinking as well. Um, so to what extent the variation um, I had experienced a variation in responses from rural students and urban students. That's something that I'm actually continuing to uncover as I go through some of the values coding. Um, a lot of, um, I actually experienced a lot of similarities in the way that students talked about their journey, um, their motivations around attending university in uh, wh whether they were from the provinces or from uh, Phnom Penh, which I was not expecting fully. Um, but uh, of course that comes with a lot of caveats. Um, university students who were from Phnom Penh weren't as concerned with developing their hometown because their hometown is one of the most developed parts of the country. And so that, that answer doesn't really ring true for them. Um, but in other ways, there were um, assumptions that some people had about people who came from one place or another. So assumptions that people in Phnom Penh just don't have any issue securing financing for education, which I did not find to be entirely true. It's more true, but it's not entirely true. Um, than people from the provinces and um, the, the way, I think the bigger variation occurred, especially if we're looking at the um, way that students chose majors was how, um, how how they thought about the image of those majors. For a lot of my uh, Phnom Penh interlocutors, um, the major that they chose was primarily self-interest motivated. So they wanted to pursue business because they had started a business when they were in elementary school um, selling candy to their friends that they had gotten from their parents. Um, those kinds of things were much more common among um, university students who grew up in Phnom Penh, whereas um, university students who I interviewed from um, the provinces were much more likely to say, I thought that I wanted to pursue, um, let's say, mathematics as a I wanted to become a, math a secondary mathematics teacher back in my hometown. And then once I arrived in Phnom Penh and, and realized the diversity of majors and other offerings that there were, um, I changed my mind and I changed my major. So there's a little bit more of that, but again, there's a lot of similarities in the different ways that students responded to these to these aspects. And that also extends um, to gender norms and renegotiating gender norms. And so there's a lot of different ways that university students overlap more than I think they even think that they do. <laughs> so there's some variation and some a lot of similarity, I guess is the way that I would answer. Okay, thank you. That's very interesting. I guess I'm having trouble with my video, so I'm gonna 
I, you can still hear me, but I'm, I'm not going to try to use my video. So um, let me read some questions from the Q&A. And again, um, other people, please um, begin writing your questions. Um, first question is from Scott Pribble. He writes, hi, Jessica, can you give us a sense of a salary range that is considered to be financially stable for college graduates in Cambodia? Yeah, so when I asked, I asked the particular question in interviews, um, what do you think is a good salary? And often people would cite around $500 per month as a good salary. Um, many would shoot for much higher. <laughs> um, but of course, that was often the students who were in, um, who were pursuing degrees in things like law and economics. <laughs> and so they have a little bit of a different perspective about what kinds of salaries that they can reach. Um, but a lot of people would answer around 500, three to 500, 300 would be a little bit low um, for them, but it would be a good starting salary. Um, but a lot of um, university students were actually making money in internships um, for a lot of um, my Euro-American audience that may come as a surprise, um, but internships in Cambodia are paid um, are roughly around $150 to $200. Obviously, that varies depending on the organization, but that's what I heard most often from, from students. So um, that was kind of the salary that they were looking to exceed after graduation, but around the $500 mark. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, um, and that's, uh, well, I'm going to insert my follow-up question to that. I mean, I'm just curious that, you know, I've been coming to Cambodia for a long time, and I think at one time, the, maybe the idea might have been more to get uh, government positions, and maybe that's less so now. Did you find in your, the people you had contact, was government service attractive to them, or or not so much? I'm sure it varies from individual to individual. Yeah, so a lot of the ways that government service came up in my interviews was that kind of reference to becoming a teacher um, yeah. or desire to become a teacher, especially when they were talking about being pushed, not, not forced, that's not the word, that's often the word that they told me that wasn't true, but kind of pushed in the direction of becoming a teacher. And so I think that government service is on a lot of people's minds when they start out, and um, as students pursue things in social sciences and particularly technology, um, going into a government ministry becomes more and more attractive. Um, obviously students in law are interested in pursuing that as well, um, particularly in kind of the business end of the legal side of things. Um, and I know a couple people who did do that after they graduated <laughs> since they've now graduated and have found jobs. Um, so there are people who are definitely still interested in the ministry um, end of the spectrum of employment, but there are also a lot of people who are interested in private sector employment, um, far less than I was expecting in nonprofit or more um, embassy type work, um, but a lot in the government ministries and private sector for sure. Okay, great. Um, so the next question is from Elizabeth Guthrie. It's in three parts. Do students ever discuss in their interviews that they need to gift or pay extra money to be allowed to study in certain fields? Does their ability to pay affect the choice of courses that they take? If so, what are the cheapest courses and what are the most expensive? Uh, yes, excellent questions. Um, the first one, I did not have anybody tell me that they needed to pay extra money at the university level to be allowed to study in certain in certain fields. That I did not hear. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I didn't hear any, any instances of it. I did hear a lot of critique around um, what people felt was corruption in that practice. Um, but that was largely directed at more secondary school experiences. So I can't speak as much to the university experience or I didn't see it as much. Um, and does their ability to pay affect their choice of courses? Yes, um, put very, very simply. Um, there was a lot of negotiation and a lot of strategizing 
around what major could allow for a scholarship at the from the government. So um, when students, I'm not sure how familiar the audience is with the um, college entrance process for young Cambodians, but as you go into your national your grade 12 national exam, you have to indicate what major and what uh, what majors you would like to pursue it's, in university in order to qualify so for government. I yeah. Oh, sorry. No bad. No bad. Okay. Um, what kinds of um, majors that they could pursue, and then the government provides scholarships based on their this how they score on the national exam, and then they get placed into particular um, programs with a particular scholarship amount, which could range from I think twenty five percent to fifty to seventy five percent. Um, so, or a hundred percent scholarship. So that definitely impacts what kinds of um, majors are are being in, are being like pushed in different ways by the government. Um, but of course, that only affects public universities for and and government sponsored scholarships in that arena. Um, within private universities, there are also a lot of scholarship opportunities that the universities provide to students. So they will, if they don't get their first choice in um, public institutions, they will often turn to private to see what kinds of, um, how they score in the entrance exams there to see whether or not this kind of major or that major would be a better fit for them financially as well as like their own personal choice. So a lot of times the choice will boil down to where they get enough money to be able to attend university. And if there is not enough, they will often take on those jobs that I was referring to before. Um, a lot of times there's there's a lot of different ways that the cheapest courses could be figured out. <laughs> so I think that that one's a little bit beyond what I could probably answer here. Um, and it's something that I'm still kind of figuring out as I go. So I would be happy to get any other additional information that um, perhaps some of the Cambodians in the audience experience as they navigate in this process or any other resources that people would be interested in sharing with me. Because um, from my, my interviews with my interlocutors, it seemed like I knew the process. And then as I continue to write and to analyze and continue to work through how to explain this process to others, um, I realized that there were some holes in what I understood as key points in the process. And so I've gone back to certain interlocutors and asked further follow-up questions <laughs> to try and figure this out as well. So what is cheapest, I think depends on a lot of factors. <laughs> and it's 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 hard to it's hard to say, but um, some of the cheaper ones or the more pushed um, uh, majors are of course tourism management and um, there are a fair number of scholarships in in the Royal University of Agriculture um, that across different different majors, including agronomy and um, agricultural sciences. Um, but there's also some a lot of scholarship programs that allow for a living stipend, which makes it easier for students to afford a lower scholarship amount for their tuition. So yeah, there's a lot of different ways that I can answer that question. <laughs> I hope, I hope that helps, at least as a start. Yes, thank you. That helps a lot. That that gives a lot of information there. Thank you. <clears throat> the next question is from <clears throat> Ji Wang. Hi, Jessica. Nice presentation. I'm curious. From my limited knowledge, I feel the education system in Cambodia is quite complicated. E.g., a lot of schools provide part-time instead of full-time study modes including both grade schools and universities. Also, there seems to be a lack of standards at various levels. How do you think this plays a role in young people's experiences and expectations for higher education? Mm, yes, so there are a lot of um, ways that young people can navigate their secondary and university experience. Um, I will say that the Cambodian education system is split so that it looks to people who are more familiar with um, a Euro-American university model. It looks like they're only studying part-time um, because they only attend class in the mornings or in the afternoons um, or on the weekends. And though that is a deliberate structure of the university system. So um, students attend classes in particular shifts and that shift is what they have for the entire semester. Um, 
sometimes for the entire the entirety of their university experience. Um, it's up to both their scholarship requirements, if they have any, and their own personal preferences. Um, and that often factors in part-time jobs that students could take. Um, and often those part-time jobs aren't seen as secondary to their experience in university. They're, they're actually also worked into a primary part, part of their experience by requiring internships um, for three to six months. So um, either in the shorter semester or the long format semester um, that university students experience. Um, um, and those and those experiences are then part of what becomes like a, a a, a preliminary thesis that they do for graduation. And that spans across agriculture, um, social sciences, business, um, digital design, all of these different types of majors. And of course, law and economics also have these kinds of requirements. Um, so there's, an, the way that the system is structured doesn't always make sense to people coming from this kind of Euro-American model, but it's something that is baked into every aspect of the Cambodian education system. Because as an elementary school student, they also went to school in shifts. As a secondary school student, they went to school in shifts and then would um, pursue extra classes um, or reimbua for pay to, to the largely their public school teachers as well, which is a practice that um, I have to say Will Brem does a lot more justice to in his work and in his book Cambodia for Sale, which talks a little bit more about the private public ways that these things are, are figured out in Cambodian education. Um, so I think that a lot of that has to factors into how young people think about hierarchy and the way that they navigate these spaces. And that question definitely goes to my second theme about how they develop social networks because one of the primary ways that they gain access to particular career paths and particular job opportunities, internships and volunteer opportunities is by expanding their network into um, this space that they have in the second half of their day when they don't have to attend classes or in the, on the weekends when they don't need to attend classes or during the week, you, you, you see where I could go here. <laughs> so the, all the different shifts kind of make this public, private, um, working student dynamic kind of function at the same time um, in a way that's actually often a lot easier than for some of my university students here in the US. Okay, thank you. All these, your answers are giving us a lot of insights into, into the whole complexity of the situation here. Mm -hmm. um, um, the next question is, is almost more like philosophical, but it has to do with your your discussions with students about their relationship to the family. And so Bora Fan says, um, what is the difference between forgiveness and renegotiation in the family? Mm. Excellent question. Um, so there's some, so I will say that my, um, my understanding of your, you're asking about forgiveness has to do with the, um, De in debt relationship that's that children have to their parents from the moment they're born um responding to that aspect of forgiveness i think it's an ongoing process um and one of the ways that i kind of talk through that process with my interlocutors is whether or not they considered themselves to be adults yet and um because none of them said that they felt like they were adults <laughs> um there is an ongoing process of repayment and continued um, moral and financial obligation that they feel to their parents in this in this form of repayment through action and through finances and through making merit for their parents and in, in achieving an education. Um, so I think you're getting at a very important part of how that then plays into the leeway that some young people feel in choosing a particular path that they feel is for them, whereas their parents think a different path is a better fit for them. Um, and that really boils down to different, different parent-child relationships and a lot of individual experiences. But I can tell you, one, that that's something that I'm actively thinking about, so I appreciate the question. And um, it spans across um, provincial and um, capital boundaries, which has broadly been glossed as urban rural boundaries. Um, so there are some 
more, there are some parents who are more willing to negotiate and willing to um, figure out this kind of pathway with their children. And there are other parents who are very limited in what they're willing to negotiate with their children. Um, so it really depends on um, a little bit of the parents' experience with education, but honestly, a lot more about how they think about those motivational narratives that are also motivating students to achieve their own or to pursue their own path in education. So the forgiveness and, and renegotiation in that way kind of becomes inter, intertwined. Um, they Students want to do well by their parents and repay their, their, their filial debt. Um, while also making sure that they can do that in a way that is successful to both them and their family and provides that kind of economic and social mobility success. Yeah. Thank you. That's a, a, a very good answer. Um, the second question also by Bora Fan, uh, what is the key motivation for students to deep commitment oh. to um, I guess I don't know what TVET is and university. Yeah. Um, technical and vocational. Okay. Yeah. I forget what the training. E stands for. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and maybe vocational, vocational education. Vocational training, educational yeah. training, or something like that. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, uh, I wish I could give a nice, distinct answer to this. Um, I think I'll try. I'll try. Um, a primary mode that the that both university student, university students that I talk to and others refer to is the development of the Cambodian nation. Um, so that's a key motivator, um, making sure that Cambodia is going into the future with a educated, um, prepared populace. That feels like a really broad <laughs> motivation. And um, it does feel a little bit above what people are thinking about their daily lives, but it is something that I, I heard voiced a lot as university students were talking to me about their own motivations um, for, for instance, developing their hometowns or providing additional um, services and role models for young people to achieve what they achieved. Why would young people want to achieve what they achieved? Because they want to become part of what would become an educated populace, an educated Cambodian populace. So I think that there is both this kind of broader level way of thinking about it, but also this very individual and and um, very um, particular particularized reason for for mo that motivates young people to attend TVET or a university. I only talk to the academic university end of the spectrum, and it would be really interesting to hear um, future research in uh, with students in TVET programs because I think a lot of students don't always see Tiva and the university as on an equal playing field or within the same kind of realm of producing possibilities. Um, at least that's what I heard from university students. We'll see if that also rings true in future research, um, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, the next question is sort of related to that one, but I'll read it. And if you, if you have things to add, we can go there. Um, but right tech writes, thank you, thank you very much for your nice presentation on your research. I want to ask how we can encourage students, high school or university to participate in social engagement in order to build their network. It's mm. a little bit different from the last question, but it's related. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do think there are a lot of people who are interested in, in, in more social engagement as they go through university. Obviously, this isn't everyone, um, but I think that there's some strong responsibility. There's some sense of um, wanting to make sure that people are on the right path um, and the country is on the right path. And so in that sense, there is there is some of that social responsibility that's starting to come up. But I also heard from a lot of my interlocutors that we need more of that. And so maybe my interlocutors offer a kind of skewed perspective of how young Cambodians are thinking about it, um, about social engagement and um, other things like that. But the, and uh, by that, I mean like civic engagement and participating in society in those ways. Um, but in terms of social engagement in university by like going out, meet, meeting people networking and doing that, 
I think my interlocutors were a, a very particular subset of that population. Um, they were the people who, in some ways you could call this survivor bias, who were really good at doing that. And so I saw a very engaged and socially networked group of people. Whereas I think if um, you were to do this research and um, solely go to the roster of students in a particular year at one particular university, you might see a much broader um, variation in the ways that students network. Um, I'm really interested in, in looking a little bit more about this as I continue to do my analysis. Um, the only thing I can say right now is making sure that we share the advice of my inter that my interlocutors gave and that the um, deans and leaders of student organization also gave to students that they came into contact with, which was find an organization, get involved in something that you're interested in. Uh, if you needed to pay well or pay at all, make sure that it's a paid internship or some other kind of opportunity um, and just kind of get your foot in the door. That is, that's often what um, my interlocutors would give as advice to other people starting out their university journey. So I don't know how much of that would be helpful, but <laughs> at least it's the start. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question is with, from uh, our good friend, Ravansara Trevilian. Uh, she writes, do Cambodian students find they're competitive for foreign postgraduate study positions abroad when they finish their studies, or are there transitions that they need to make before entering a more Euro-American system? Mm. Um, I can't say that my my research speaks directly to this, um, yeah. but um, I, did, I did hear um, some not hesitation per se, but concern for some universe that some university students had in pursuing bachelor's degrees abroad when they were educated in the uh, public school system. Um, there's a lot of hesitation and a lot of um, concern around whether they can access the kinds of scholarship opportunities that they want or or in need, or um, they could even apply effectively with what they had. And so um, I have a, a, a bit of a different, pers like I guess, perspective and a bit of a different um, orientation, but there were some students who were able to leverage scholarship programs um, based in the US and in Australia, like nonprofit organizations that provided scholarships directly to university students and their universities for tuition, um, who were able to navigate that change. But often those um, scholarships have a lot of application hurdles that not every um, young Cambodian is willing to make and go through as part of their experience. So I can't speak to whether they're competitive or not. I can speak to the fact that people told me that it, it felt really difficult to achieve those things. Um, but I do know a lot of people who go and do master's degrees abroad or pursue other, other scholarship opportunities. So it, um, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. where I'm at with Yeah, that would be my observation too. I uh, but without having studied it systematically, that there are um there are problems in 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 you know Cambodian programs having recognition as, um as of international standards, and yet somehow uh one way or another that um there are scholarships and some some Cambodian students really are successful in mm -hmm. in pursuing high uh, postgraduate degrees overseas. Okay, well, let's go on. We, we have a lot of, we keep getting questions. This is wonderful. Um, the next question is by Sam Eun. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your nice presentation on your research. I have a simple question. Seeing the word motivation, it reminds me of two types of motivation, intrinsic and extrin extrinsic. Mm -hmm. To your idea, which one do you think is more effective in terms of encouraging Cambodian students to learn better? Mm. So I think that there is a bit of both operating for all of my interlocutors. And so I would say a very frustrating answer 
yes to both. <laughs> there is definitely <laughs> intrinsic motivations that my interlocutors told me about how they, they were just really motivated to learn and they really wanted to learn. <laughs> um, but then there were a lot of extrinsic factors that brought them to pursue education. They wanted to do more things. They wanted to experience more of what life could offer them in other parts of the country, in other forms of study. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of, I, I would consider that a lot of extrinsic motivation in terms of reaching for a particular reward or reaching for a particular um, non-internal end um, in different ways. But what's best depends on, on the students. And I think a mix of both, like instilling a love of, of learning and instilling a love of the process of going through school, it is a tough battle. Um, being a former secondary math teacher, myself it is a, it was a constant struggle in my own classroom to foster those kinds of um, motivations in my students as well because they were coming into the classroom with a variety of different experiences and a variety of different expectations for what school should be so it I agree it's a great question I I wish I could give a better answer <laughs> no I, I think you you addressed it very well and um yeah it's a big issue um tall non tan writes why did you choose this topic to discuss in Cambodia? Yeah, um, I guess I can go a little bit into my own background in studying, um, studying in Cambodia. Um, so prior to, in my bachelor's degree, I was participating in a nonprofit organization that provided scholarships to um, orphaned Cambodian children who to attend private primary and secondary schools. So that is when I started my engagement with and interest in about how the education system in Cambodia works. And that was back in around 2009 that I got patient. Um, and, and my continued involvement in both the scholarship recipients and then um, becoming more involved as, as a teacher after I graduated from my bachelor's and figuring out what for students, I started to ask more questions about what program, what do you, what do we mean by best program for students? Um, and so a lot of those questions circled into, well, what is it at school and how does it create the type of learning that people want to want to learn and why are certain things in Cambodia valued over others? Um, because as I went through my research process for my master's degree, which focused on those private primary and secondary schools in Phnom Penh, I started to wonder why certain um, private schools were being targeted um, as, as good and others weren't, or why some programs such as program was seen as redundant while the English program was seen as advantageous and effective for students to do um, in the Khmer program because a lot of um, young people in, in, that I interviewed in Phnom Penh um, attended both public school for their for a first shift and then in a second shift they attended private school and so there was this intermixing throughout their entire educational experience about what kinds of um, learning and what kinds of education and what kinds of school were valuable. So as I kept going through that process of asking those questions and started asking the question of, well, what end is this serving? How are people going through life and choosing what to do next after these private primary and secondary schools? Well, they're choosing to go on to university and study particular things, which is where my dissertation topic kind of originated from. So all of that is how I've been thinking about both my own personal trajectory in understanding education in Cambodia, but also how these all these aspects of um, Cambodia's life to this moment of graduation, uh, particularly as people do so much for university and take opportunities and so many um, and overcome so many obstacles. So that's how I chose this to discuss this topic in Cambodia in particular, um, as I go through my dissertation and I researched more about the, the history of the education system, it's become increasingly clear that the education system in Cambodia has a lot to say about what education can be and what schooling can be in a variety of different contexts. Um, and I think that that's an important thing to 
bring into discussions about what the universe around the world. Thanks, that's a great answer. Um, <clears throat> the next question is by Rata Long, and I think you could interpret it more than one way. It's a very general question. Can you share your expectation from your research topic? Mm. That, that could mean different, yeah. more than one things, but what what is your reaction to that? So, um, mm. uh, yeah, I guess my expectation from my own research I can interpret that, I guess, as a hypothesis. I was expecting a little bit more of a clear-cut dichotomy between um, experiences of students from the provinces and students from, from Phnom Penh, and that hasn't been the case. So assumptions have been shattered <laughs> in, in my research process. Um, but I guess the other expectations, what I hope to do with my research is to um, first engage um, in discussions with Cambodian scholars, which I'm very happy to be starting here with this with this webinar, um, and sharing a lot of the experiences in, in, uh, in a way that Cambodians can access, um, sharing the, my interlocutor's experience in a way that Cambodians can access. So um, hope that that is something that I can provide as I continue to write and as I continue to think about these, these issues. Okay, thank you. And um, Tokla Mert writes, um, hello, Jessica. Some people feel the education style of schools damages originality and creativity. What do you think? Oh, that's, that awesome. that's an issue in, in Western <laughs> countries, but maybe every country, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it is a common question, <laughs> more common to admit in a lot of different ways. Uh, I, I think I'll have to draw on some, since I don't sit in classrooms as often for my research, like I said, I spend a lot of time outside of university spaces um, or in, in less classroom spaces and more in the like mingling and social spaces around the university. Um, I don't see as much of that side of the university student experience as others who conduct research might, but I can tell you what people tell me <laughs> about that kind of experience. Um, and what I also have read in, in my own literature reviews of this. Uh, and first, a lot of people are very frustrated with um, the more hierarchical aspects of their education and um, the need and just, need for standardized testing in this kind of grade nine and grade 12 examination schedule. Um, and so that's a serious frustration that students have that I can't discount. And it's something that was said to me over and over again. Um, however, um, I think that there's also a little bit more room for students to negotiate those boundaries of creativity um, when they get into their um, extra classes or being boa. Um, which I was not expecting, but um, other people who have spent more time in those in those classroom spaces and attending extra classes like that, like um, like I referenced before, Will Brem's work, um, he talks through that actually about the difference in the way that the classroom is structured in both the the regular classes, the regular government school classes, and these um, extra classes that students attend for payment. And I can say that um, in some respects, it varies depending on your payment, <laughs> what kind of environment, what kind of learning environment you're going to engage in. Um, but also, um, I do think that the hierarchical relationships can't be discounted regardless of what kind of learning environment it is. And so there's some stifling of creativity that may happen regardless. And I think that that's also true in a variety of different ways in, in American education. But with a less concern about the patron client relationship and the hierarchical nature of how people should act in those learning spaces. So I do wanna recognize that that is something that I think that some Cambodian students feel very stifled about as they look towards becoming their own adults and making their own opinions and um, trying to come up with their own plans. They feel frustrated by the continued emphasis on what they consider to be the teaching of theory and the lack of teaching of practice or application of the things that they would like to do. So I think that they have to go elsewhere outside of the university in things like um, 
thinking off the top of my head, like the smart competitions and all of these variety of different competitions that have popped up in the past 10 years for secondary school students and university students. That's a big space for young people to be more creative, but it also takes a lot of time from their other aspects of their life. So it's, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and, and you you address it very well. Thank you so much. Well, we're getting close to the end and some un writes after the end of this webinar, would you mind sending both video and slides in our emails? Thanks in advance. I personally don't know the technology of that involved, but I hope the CKS staff can help that. Okay, I'm yeah. gonna ask the final question. Um, and because somehow I'm always attracted to <coughs> ironies and exceptions <laughs> and things. So, um, you know, in some ways the, your presentation sort of emphasized sort of this, to me, it seems sort of an idealized situation, I, rather idealized motivations. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. Would you could you give one or two exceptions of uh, examples of sort of oddball exceptions, which which would contra you know there must have been people you talked to who weren't that way at all. I mean, am, I'm sorry if I'm assuming that too much, but could would you care to give us an one or two oddball exceptions to the things you're you're say, writing about or? Oh, absolutely. There's always uh, exceptions. <laughs> yes. Um, so I say that everybody, a great example is I say everybody marches towards marriage. Yeah. There yeah. was one man who was like, I am staying a bachelor forever and I uh -huh. will not listen to any, any pressure that anyone places on me about, about getting married. Uh -huh. That's, that's yeah. not yeah. my life. <laughs> yeah. um, but the, yeah. on the motivation end of things, um, there were students who really like, I say that they wanted to give back and become role models. No, they wanted to leave their, their families behind. They wanted to start a family in Phnom Penh and they wanted to live their lives. They they didn't cut ties or sever relations with their family yeah, in yeah. kind of a disowning way, but yeah. they did not feel the same kind of social obligation that other students expressed to me very clearly. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's not actually a, a small number either. There's, yeah, yeah. There were quite a who also felt unheard by their families and um, because they had different priorities in terms of how they were spending their time and what they thought was valuable. Their families wanted them to get married and find a job to support each other, whereas they wanted to continue schooling, but their family felt that schooling was a drain on their finances and they wouldn't support it. So yeah, um, there were definitely, there are definitely exceptions. <laughs> okay, okay, well, that's great. And thank you, Jessica, for, a very interesting presentation, and and I think the question and answer period was very, very interesting too. And I, you, you, you know, you definitely demonstrated how the the breadth of the your topic and your ability to see it from many different angles. So thank you very much. And Absolutely. and um, so um, okay. Well, I think we'll close now. So okay, okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you, everyone, for coming. Um, okay. <laughs> bye. Bye.